I want to talk about faith today, but before I talk about faith, I need to talk about and build a foundation of understanding. How many people know that we need to have understanding? If I could, Mark, let's go to Hosea 4.6. Hosea 4.6 is a strong statement in the Old Testament, but it proves true today in the New Testament as well. Hosea 4.6 reads, My people are destroyed... For lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest. Of course, now we know through Jesus nobody's rejected. We know that we have the mind of Christ. We know that we've been given all things now. This is Old Testament, but still, if we reject knowledge, even though we've been given to it, how do you reject? How do you reject things that have already been given to you? Doubt. Unbelief. Unbelief, that you just don't have them. You don't know how to utilize them. Or you're just ignorant in on the facts of how to utilize them, right? It still goes back to doubt, unbelief, not having knowledge, correct? I mean, it's not a, you know, it's not a, um, you know, I'm not trying to disgrace anybody by using that word being ignorant of something. It just means that you just don't have any understanding, and that's okay, right? Because we're going to get there. Amen? How many times I've been ignorant of something? Oh my goodness. Whew. If I had a penny, we'd be rich for every time. Yeah, I mean, whew. but anyhow, so again, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, uh, let's go to Ephesians 1 7. <clears throat> Or we can go to Proverbs 4, 7, either one. They're right by one another, right up at the top. All right. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you, this was a prayer, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of who? Of him. In the knowledge of him. So again, wisdom, revelation, understanding. It's super important. We all know the parable about the seed that fell by the road and the ones that were unknowledgeable and didn't have very deep root in them and what happened and the enemy came and took the seed. We all know about the worries and cares of life comes in, strangles you out. We all know that parable, right? We're not going there today, but that all goes back into understanding and having wisdom and understanding concerning certain things. Um, let's go to Second Peter. 318. Real quick, I want to get through this. But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because everything is encompassed in Him. Everything. Everything that has to do with life has to do with Him. Everything's been given to Him, and guess who He's given everything to? Us. Everything. That's why they call it the good news. Shouldn't be the challenging news. Should not be the hard news, the hard to understand news. Let's go to Proverbs 4 7, last one. The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. And with all your acquiring, get what? Understanding. Now, I say this, but, you know, I. I'm not talking about semantics here like potato, patata, but I'm actually talking about different things in Scripture. <clears throat> How many people understand when it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? That's, that's riddled throughout the Old Testament, and it's in the New Testament. It's there. It's more prominent in the Old Testament, but it's there in the New Testament. But how many people know that there's got to be an understanding behind that? Because also in the New Testament, we see what? Fear is not of God, right? Those who fear, they believe in punishment. They're, they're, those who are in fear believe that they're going to be punished, is what the Bible says. Right? Love, perfect love, casts out what? Fear, which would make you believe that fear is the bad guy here, right, on this Right? Correct? But there's got to be an understanding. So, so many people swing one way, and they discard the rest. 
but we've got to have understanding that when you look at the totality, the sum of that, when it says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God, when you look at that, that means to hate all that's evil. That's all. Sum that up. It means to hate all that's evil. Hate, strong language. Hate all that is evil. I didn't say hate a person. I said hate all that's evil. You can hate the evilness that's coming out of someone's mouth. That's okay. You can hate the actions of someone that is committing evil. You can hate that. You're supposed to. The Bible talks about that. To be distant from that. To not like that. You can hate what somebody's saying. What somebody stands for. But we also know, having wisdom and understanding, we also know, that what? You're not battling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, things that are dominating them behind the scenes. So you've got to have that understanding, and you've got to approach and maintain an attitude of love, a foundation of love. Because I'll tell you what, love is the only thing that will open up a doorway into that person's life. That's it. There's nothing else. I've tried it. I've argued with people till I was blue in the face. I have thrown scripture at people till I was green in the face. I have chased people down and beat them over the head with the Bible so many times, and it's got me nowhere. But when I did not like, I hated what they were saying, I hated what they stood for, I hated the movement they got behind, but yet <clears throat> I approached them non judgmental. I approached them with an attitude of honor. Right? I didn't go along with what they stood for. But still, I didn't throw them into pits of hell. I didn't try to beat them over the head with the Bible. I approached them with a foundation of love. It got their attention. They wanted what I had. Because they were dry for love on the inside. That's where all this hate and things were coming from. So when they saw that, they wanted more. And this would open them up to come and want to talk more, hang out more, get witness to. And I've seen it. Love is the only thing. And because I love somebody it does not mean that I identify with what's coming out of their mouth. You don't have to. You don't have to jump over into that party and be their defender because you love them. See, this is where we need to know balance and have understanding, as the word says, understanding. Everybody with me so far? Romans 12, 9. I don't think you have it, Mark. <clears throat> it says, Let your love be without hypocrisy and abhor what is evil. Anything that's evil. Anybody know what abhor means? That's right. Hate evil. Hate it. That's New Testament. Romans 12.9, if anybody wants to look it up. Or is that a four? A okay, 12.9. I got my glasses on. They're right there. All right, yeah. <clears throat> so anyway. So 12.9. Abhor evil. So we've got to get this balance because you see so many people just pull to one side and discredit the other. They discredit the other, pull to this side and forget about this scripture, pull to that side, forget about that. Oh, well, that scripture's not for today. That's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. We're in... How many times have you heard that? Right? Right? There's still value there. It still points to Jesus in those things. It still gives you principles and understanding. <clears throat> so, anyway, how about this? Here's another, you want another example? Understanding. How about discipleship? I've noticed this, and I've kept my mouth shut a lot. But there's always been something off with discipleship. And what I mean by that is that if you go back and look at the word discipleship, it comes from a rabbinical meaning of what? A follower. 
a follower of a rabbi is a rabbi has the disciples that are followers of a rabbi. And by following him, <clears throat> they're told what to do, what not to do, how to do it, when to do it. They're following, they're picking up and learning by example and becoming like that rabbi. They're followers of a rabbi, teachers. They're being taught, following and taught. Now, I understand there's nothing wrong with that word. But I also see in the New Testament where we're not called to be disciples. We're called to be sons and daughters. And there's a difference. Sons and daughters. Sons and daughters who don't follow Jesus but have Jesus living in them. In them. Co-laboring together, not following behind co-laboring together with Christ in you. And I've seen the spirit of discipleship cancel out the spirit of sonship in churches before. Oh, well, if you want to be like Jesus, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to show up at this time, you got to do that, you got to follow this rule, you got to do that, you got to do this, you got to come here, show you how to do this and do that and do this, make sure you do that and do this. That's how you're a disciple of Jesus. Instead of a son, you're already all of those things. Let's get the sonship buried deep into your identity and then watch everything else come out of you naturally. Or a daughtership. So I've seen discipleship try to smother sonship and daughtership. I've seen it. I've seen it for a long time. Making sense? That's another way. We've got to have wisdom. We've got to have knowledge. We've got to have understanding. Let's go to Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives where? Say it again. Christ lives in me. In me. In me. All right. Moving on. All right. Let's go to... Before we do that, let me build this little foundation on faith. <coughs> Excuse me. You guys know how I love to go back to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. If you know anything about me, that's like one of my favorite go-to verses, right? Because that's where Paul talks about that we're made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Human spirit. Body, soul, and human spirit. That's our three parts. You know how much I've taught on the fact that <clears throat> one-third, which is your spirit man, which is born again, when you become born again, it's sealed in the Holy Spirit. So your spirit man comes alive, sealed in the Holy Spirit, and it becomes perfect, righteous, and it becomes the best that it'll ever be. It is now one-third of you, besides for your soul and your body, your spirit man is as perfect as it'll ever be. That's why now we don't need the bloods of bulls and goats to get into the heavenly of heavenlies and the holy of holies. That's why we don't need the veil to be in our way anymore because God is spirit and all those who come to him must come to him in spirit. So it's our human spirit that has been made righteous because of the cross. And now we just go right into the heavenlies and speak to our father. Spirit to spirit. There's a spirit to spirit trans, right? transference that goes on. From the Father to our spirit, there's a download in the spirit, man. That spirit has been made righteous. It says we've been given the gift of righteousness. It's a complete done deal. We are righteous in our spirit. Guess what else has been given to us? We've been given the full measure of faith. How many times do I run in, well, my faith just wasn't good enough? How many times this week did I hear, Man, I don't even have faith like a mustard seed. Man, if, if, if 
that would have happened if I would have had faith, or that would have happened if you would have had more faith. How many times this week have I heard, well, I need to grow my faith. What if I was to tell you today that you don't need to grow any faith? What if I was here to tell you today that the same measure of faith that Peter and Paul and everybody had was deposited into your spirit, man, just like the gift of righteousness on salvation. At the moment of salvation, everything was given to you and put into your spirit. The same measure of faith that when Paul walked by and his shadow or his scarf healed people. Peter is saying, you know, silver and gold, I have none of them, but what I do, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. Lepers being healed, calling the dead out of the grave, all that has been placed already in your spirit. God is spirit. It's deposited in you already. So, I mean, not only should we think about then, how do I pray? Man, if this is true what Pastor Mark is saying, then my prayer life's got to change. Because all I do is ask God for stuff and I don't hear nothing back. All I do is beg God for stuff and nothing happens. All I do, I mean, <clears throat> this is a point. We've, we've got to, if what I'm saying is right, this should revolutionize your life. Our prayer life has got to completely change. <clears throat> So we've had this faith deposited into our spirit along with a new creation we've been given, along with the mind of Christ, along with every heavenly benefit, everything now, past tense, has been put in us. Let's go to Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. For, wait, back up. I want to do this again. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Through faith. So at the point of salvation, through grace and faith. How many people know that Jesus isn't going to make it hard for you to get saved? He's not going to make it hard for you to access faith. The only thing I've ever seen grow, it's not faith, it's my authority. My authority is cultivated. It's grown. And it's grown under how much this dies. They're linked together. God's glory is linked to that. I talked a little bit about that earlier. For by grace you have been saved... Through faith and not of yourself. So it's not of yourself. So how can you say you got to grow your faith? How can you say you have to grow your faith when it is not of yourself? It is a gift of God. Next verse. Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. No one can boast in growing it. No one. Let's go to Romans 12, 3. <clears throat> For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself or herself, that he or she ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each the measure of faith. To each. Second Peter one one. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received, you guys read it. To those who have received, oh, stop right there. Uh oh, uh oh, he might have made his point now. 
I might, the other couple scriptures, I wasn't getting it, but this one I can't argue with. This one I just can't fight. This one I just can't throw out. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. (laughs) Same kind as ours. Same kind as ours. You mean to tell me that I got the same faith in me, the same level, same measure deposited in my spirit, man, that Peter had, that Paul had? I've already got that? Well, what's going on? How come it's getting canceled out? What's happening here? Well, we're going to talk about that. Because now I'm just now getting started. But first, before we get into answering that question, we have to answer this question. 1 John four seventeen. All right, now remember... Same faith like Peter has. Same measure. But this, love is perfected with us so that we have confidence in the day of judgment. That means when we stand before the Lord, right? Futuristic, right? Because as He is, so also are we in what? Boy, that's a whole sermon within itself. If you want to go talk about the great white throne of judgment, the bimini seat of Christ. If you want to talk about all that's tied into how you operate in this world. Yes, it's all tied into it. But that's not where I'm going. But this is the part I want you to focus on. Because as he is, so also are we in the heavens to come. No, did it, does it say that? Does it say that? Huh. Wait a second, let's read it again. Because as he is, this is Jesus, because as he is, hold on a second, Jesus is growing his faith right now in heaven. Wait a second, Jesus is growing his faith in heaven. As we speak, as he is in heaven, so also are we in this world. He's not growing his faith in heaven, ladies and gentlemen. No. He's not working off righteousness in heaven, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. Kind of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Now, this is very interesting. Let's go to Philemon 1.6. This is a prayer. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. Look at this. He did not pray and ask God that his faith would grow and become effective. What did he say? And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through knowledge. Of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. Look at that. He did not pray and try to get his faith to grow. No, he's talking. He's praying to have it become effective through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. How do you make what's already been given to you effective? Understand what Jesus paid for on that cross. And one third of that is living in you. That's how. That's the good news. That's what makes your faith come alive and effective. Boy, it's quiet in here. Thank you guys for that thunderous quiet. Amazing. Bob. Look at Bob. He's, he's back there. A little pillow behind his head. Real snoozer today, huh, Bob? As Pastor Jimmy would say, it's a real snoozer today. All right. Second Peter 1, 3 through 4. Seeing that his divine power has granted, here it is again, 
His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to this life and godliness through the true knowledge. Again, through him. Your faith becomes effective through him, through the true knowledge of him. Everything has been, get all power has already been granted to you. Everything pertaining to this life has already been given. Let me ask you a question. Where is it at? Hold on a second. Everything pertaining to this life has already been given. Where is it at? It's in your spirit. Everything. Everything. Everybody say everything. everything. So now we really got to watch out how we pray. God, help me get it out of me. God, help me figure out who I am in you already. God, help me speak and for things to start coming out, Lord, help me die to this flesh and see your glory and walk around in your anointing that's already on me and in me. Come to ATM class. You'll figure that one out. So anyway, um, <clears throat> seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to this life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. There's no denying these scriptures. You've already got it. You've all already got it. This is how Jesus could walk around and just speak, and it would come out of him, and things would change. Or he'd lay hands, because it would all come out of him. When the lady with the issue of blood grabbed him, the power went out of him. Out of him. It's already in you. We don't have to ask for it and beg God for it. It's already in you. This is the good news. Mark 9, 19 through 26, please. <clears throat> and he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. Now, here's a little backdrop on this. So there was a father that had approached the disciples and asked them, Hey, I see you follow this Jesus of Nazareth, okay? And even for me to have enough guts to ask you guys to help me, it means that I'm going to be kicked out of the synagogues. Because if you were seen talking to one of the disciples or talking to Jesus, you were automatically banished from the synagogues. Something traditionally your family and your household did your whole entire life generationally. You were taking a big chance. I want to say something now, but it probably wouldn't go over well. <clears throat> kind of like in today's times, but I'm not. But anyhow, so you were taking a huge chance. This man came to the disciples first. Other people saw him. This means his card is gone. He's no longer a member. And asked them to cast out a demon that was throwing his kid into the fire, and the disciples could not do it. Now, did they need to grow their faith? No. What's going on with them? What's happening with them? There's one thing that cancels out the measure of faith we've all been given, and that is doubt. That's unbelief. That's it. It's unbelief. Now, the question is, can you have unbelief and belief at the same time? Come on. <clears throat> the rumor is, the rumor is that you cannot. But I'll tell you right now, you can. The rumor says, well, you can either have belief or you're in unbelief. There is no middle ground. Either you believe or you don't believe. There's no middle ground. But I'm here to tell you there's a big middle ground. There's a big middle ground. I can be in belief and I can be in unbelief at the same time. At the same exact time. And I'll share an example with that in a few minutes, but let's keep reading through this. And he answered them and said, oh, unbelieving generation. See, here it is. Unbelieving. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into convulsion. 
And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. Now, we, we could unpack this for a long time and get so many different avenues and scriptures and Bible studies out of it. But how many people know that when the enemy, when it starts to get at its worst, the enemy showed his hand, his time is limited? How many people know that's a, that's a sign, that's a dead giveaway? The enemy wants to go unseen. But when he's discovered, he intensifies the attacks when he's discovered because he knows he's been discovered and his time is limited. And he tries to hurt the person even more or kill them or take them with him or show out even more to cause fear on the person that might deliver them. It's like that time when I say this a lot, when you put dirt in the bottom of a Coke bottle, you pour clean water in, that dirt finally has to come to the top. Because all that clean stuff's going in, that dirt's coming to the top. When it's coming to the top, it looks bad. That's what's happening here. So Jesus says, bring the boy to me. He threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground and began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. Next one. And he asked his father, now check this out, why in the world would Jesus ask this question? Is this just a benign question? Is he just trying to be, hey man, how long has your son been like this? Hmm? Just trying to be buddies with him? Just trying to be relational? Does anybody not find this weird? Why? Bring your son to me. The son starts to come forward. The demon starts manifesting. The guy's foaming at the mouth, jumping around. You know it's only a matter of time. It's Jesus. Why does Jesus say, well, how long has he been like this? What is he pointing out to us? That it's just not a physical healing we're dealing with here. It's a mental healing. And emotional healing we've got to deal with, too. Because Jesus asked, how long has this boy been like this? And it's just not recent he's been like this. He's been like this since childhood. Meaning that his identity has been formed that he's a sick kid. His identity has been formed in the fact that he all the time is unwell. His emotions tell him he's all the time unwell. His mind tells him that he's unwell. His identity is wrapped around the fact that he is not well. It's not just the physical healing he needs. He needs the whole, complete package. How many people here have been like that before? You've been sick for so long that that's become your identity. You've been struggling for so long that that's become your identity. That's the way you think. That's the way you prepare. I know people that have been that have been sick, and they, they were told that if they got this medicine or this operation, that it would take that away, and they could come off of any kind of assistance and go back to work. But they've been on there thinking they're sick. Their mentalities around them being sick. They're emotionally sick. Their mind is sick. Even though their body can be healed, they didn't want to because they're so used to it. That's their identity now. They didn't want to do that. Oh, no, I've been like this for 30 years. Everybody knows me as this. I've, I've, I've become friends with this. I've accepted this as my life. How long have you been like this, Jesus said? How long has he been like this? <clears throat> and he said from childhood. Next. I mean, how many people during sinus, when, when allergy season strikes up, how many people are like, oh, I got to go out and get ready for allergy season? And, you know, just that it's ingrained in us, right? I mean, my body hasn't even yet felt any allergies, but yet we're out preparing for it. We're, we're speaking that we're sick. We're going to be sick. My body just is going to be messed up here in a couple months. It's more than a physical healing. It's an emotional healing. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Next. And Jesus said to him, wait a second. And Jesus said to him, if 
you what? If you can. Uh Uh-oh. Jesus put it back on you, didn't he? What are you talking about? You want your son healed? If you can. He didn't accept that. He didn't rebuke the guy either, like he did the disciples for the unbelief that messed them up is why they couldn't cast it out. Let's go to the next scripture. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, but help my unbelief. You can have belief and unbelief at the same time. There's been so many times that, man, I have been pumped. I have been, I'm just going to talk about myself. I'm embarrassed myself. You guys ready? There's been so many times I've been pumped in the spirit. I mean, I'm talking like all the, my, I, in my own mind, my faith is greater than all y'all's, even though it's the same measure. In my own mind, I'm just ready to go. I dare someone to walk in and have an issue or a problem, <clears throat> and I've done that before. And, man, I've ran up there with all the passion inside of me, all the faith in the world, no doubt that I thought. And I ran up there, and I'd lay hands on somebody. And <clears throat> I remember one time this guy had his, his hands, as he pulled them out, one arm was shorter than the other. And I laid hands on it, and I just... Okay, in the name of Jesus, I command this arm to grow out in Jesus' name. And boom, nothing happened. Everybody was looking at me, and I was like, I was like, I'm sorry. Have a seat. Apologize. You know what I mean? And, and what was it? I had faith, but I also had doubt because why? Because I was also caught up in the fear of the thoughts and opinions of people and what they would say or what they would think. People watching me. <clears throat> well, God, what if you didn't perform? What if I open my eyes and it hasn't grown back? What are they going to say? Are they going to laugh? Are they going to chuckle? Are they going to think I'm an idiot? Oh, come on, man. These thoughts went through my head. Even though I was had all kind of faith already given to me, already established in me. <clears throat> there was, I was just full of this belief that this could happen, but I was just as full of people watching me and fear of the thoughts and opinions of people and their judgments and their conclusions. <clears throat> and 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says, we do not dare classify or compare ourselves with one another. We do not dare judge other people and classify and say, oh, well, you're wearing that shirt. I should probably be wearing a better shirt or what. We don't just don't compare, classify and compare. We, the thoughts and the fear, how many people got fear of thoughts and opinions of people? Am I the only one sometimes? What people might think? <coughs> Especially if you step out. What's someone going to say? Well, that's the doubt that you can have at the same time with your belief that will cancel it out. <clears throat> I remember reading in a Smith Wigglesworth book one time, and this was a man of great, great, like, miracles, signs, wonders, his whole ministry. And um, I was reading in a book, and he was at, like, a church crusade, <clears throat> and there's a woman that came up in her whole abdomen area down here in groin area was swollen with a tumor cancerous tumor in her and he had people bring her up and stop and he said she could barely walk and he had them stop short and say let go of her and they let go of her and she fell and everybody went oh my gosh and then he's like pick her up they picked her up And he said, let her go. They let her go, and she fell right on her face again, right on the tumor. Everybody was yelling, you animal, you beast, stop that. The guys that were picking her up said, we're not doing that again. He said, pick her up, do what I tell you to do. And they were like, no, we're not going to drop her again. They picked her up, and she was in pain. Said, drop her. Said, no, we're not going to do it again. Somebody yelled in the book when I was reading, called him a beast for doing this to her. He said, listen, I know my job. Drop her. 
And he, they, they, they dropped her, and she fell. He said, pick her up for the third time. And when they picked her up, the tumor fell out from underneath her dress right onto the stage. Now, if do you think he cared about the thoughts and opinions of those people that were howling at him and threatening him because of what he, he was mistreating this woman? Because he was being insensitive to her need? Do you think he cared? No, me, the first time she fell and fell on herself, I'd be like, oh my God, you saw, I'm so sorry. Let me, I shouldn't have done that. I, here, here's 50 bucks. That's all I got. You know, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. You know, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, not this guy because he understood. There was no doubt there. He absolutely understood that it was critical. He had faith that the Spirit of God was wanting to heal her, and he did not stop until it happened. Right? That's the difference. That's what I'm talking about here. That is the difference. I want to ask Diane if she wants to start getting ready to come up. Let's continue on through there. I believe that's, that's probably it, right? No, 26. We'll read the two next two. When Jesus saw that the crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. Next. After crying out and throwing him <clears throat> into a terrible convulsion, it came out, and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said he was dead. Praise God. Amen. I always tell people that whenever there's a deliverance, it's a kiss from the Lord. He's not out to embarrass you. He's not out to punish you with a deliverance. He's not out to rub your face in the fact that there might be a, a demonic spirit trying to harass you or your family. It's a kiss from heaven. It says the kingdom of God has manifested upon you when an unclean spirit is casted out. It's, it's, a, it's a divine, like, moment of compassion from the Father to you to see you delivered and set free. Amen? It's not to embarrass you. It's not to make you feel indifferent. 